Hello, everyone. Welcome to JNOC Day 2. Thank you so much for being here. Um, today, this session is on device content filtering. And our lovely host is walking up, Hernan Romero. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for making it here. Uh, my name is Hernan Romero. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm product manager here at Jamf, uh, working around content filtering and save internet. So today, for real, I want you to leave this session knowing that you can have more and better security at your organization without having to compromise your employees or students' privacy. In fact, there's only three words that you need to remember when you leave this session or if you're behind the screen, which is more, better, and privacy friendly. You'll be hearing these throughout. What is it? Well, because we have more powerful iPhones and iPads and new network APIs from Apple, we've been able to move evaluation of web protection policies from the cloud to the device. We're calling it the on-device content filter. It uses Apple network, an Apple network extension to analyze traffic at socket level directly on device. The semi-sandbox architecture of this network extension lets you have more and better security in a privacy-friendly way. The on-device content filter for iOS and iPadOS is a web protection technology we're bringing for both Jam Security Cloud and Jamf Safe Internet. Before going any further, there's four key questions I want to answer about Jamf's on-device content filter for iOS and iPadOS. How is it more powerful? How is it more privacy friendly? Who is it for? And can I see it in action? Of course, the answer for that is yes, you can. Since, well, on-device content filter is deeply integrated with Apple's architecture in an unrestricted way, we can go beyond usual domain-based rules, which is why it's so powerful. We're able to, for instance, evaluate URLs, including paths and query parameters. This was previously impossible to do without, with HTTPS traffic without TLS decryption. So TLS decryption is quite taxing on the user experience, also not very privacy preserving, but with the on-device content filter, we can achieve basically the same results. So with the exception, like exception rules that we can create for URLs, we can, for instance, get a domain that we want to block and then have a path that we want to allow. So it's an exception rule. There's some kit services that are part of a, a big service that, that you would like to allow as part of that whole website. And that's really great for schools. Or even um, in the commercial side, there might be Twitter accounts that spread a lot of uh, uh, like phishing links and you don't want your employees to get access to that, so that's an easy way to block a specific path, right? Rather than getting all, the, all of your employees to block a specific uh, um, Twitter account. Um, IP addresses, that's another key vector for threat actors. So IP addresses are very easy to hide in, in, a, in the noise, and we're able to block that with the on-device content filter. Uh, another uh, aspect about IP addresses is that uh, a user can easily circumvent a domain-based rule by finding out what's the IP address for that. And we're able to block single uh, IP addresses, ranges, and subnets with the on-device content filter. Thirdly, we've got bundle IDs. So bundle IDs, they're basically like the domains for apps at Apple. And usually, it's been very tough to block traffic around uh, specific apps. Uh, usually, we, we would have used user agents or tried to triangulate all the traffic around a specific app, all the requests that are being made in out incoming and outgoing traffic. And that's actually quite tough to do and uh, not very uh, airtight, but with the with the on-device content filter, we're able to block bundle IDs, and as a result, all incoming and outgoing traffic is blocked. And then, uh, finally, we've got keywords and key phrases. So uh, with that, you're able to, for instance, block uh, words or phrases that you might find uh, in the URL or the content of the websites. And this is huge because you can have really broad rules around, for instance, inappropriate content at schools. Or maybe uh, if you are you know, in the commercial side, you can have some DLP uh, policy in place where you can block specific keywords as well around confidential information. So it's very clear 
that with the on-device content filter, you can do way more than ever before. Just to show you how powerful um, the on-device content filter is, I'm going to walk through a traffic, the usual traffic flow uh, with an example. So first, the Jamf Trust app downloads, uh, it fetches a policy um, from, uh, yeah, from our cloud. And this, for instance, we've got a policy around blocking phishing and TikTok.com as an example. Nothing specific around it. Um, and uh, maybe when, once it's stored in the on-device policy, uh, the user will, for, ex for example, go to a very dubious site. And when that request is made, uh, the on-device content filter asks our threat intelligence, what is it classified as? And the answer is phishing. As a result, that response that we get is blocked. Now, this response is now cached in the on-device policy. So next time the user goes and makes that same request, there's no need to ask the threat intelligence. It's blocked immediately on the device. Similarly, if you have any explicit rule, as you can see there for TikTok.com, um, there's no need to ask, ask the threat intelligence. It's just blocked immediately. So there's less round trips versus cloud-based cloud uh, uh, vectoring, which means lower latency and faster user experience for the end user. We could say, in a way, that this is the security equivalent of declarative device management. Uh, what's more, you can have uh, tens of thousands of rules in the cache stored, uh, which is great without any uh, perceivable change in latency. And uh, as a bonus as well, if you have users who use uh, personal VPNs, uh, these rules, uh, they cannot be bypassed with a uh, personal VPN, as opposed to uh, cloud-based uh, vectoring. So you can do more, and you can also do it better with the on-device content filter. How is it more privacy preserving? Well, thanks to Apple's semi-sandboxed architecture of the network extension, there's privacy by design. Evaluation is done in the encrypted side of the network extension, where all sensitive data is stored. For example, you get the query parameters, the content of a website. As an example here, you can see a path, and then you can see uh, part of the DOM here. So you've got just a heading there of a topic that you might be interested in. And uh, then in that case, all of that evaluation is done there in this black box in the network extension, where it's totally out of bounds for reporting but it's all access for evaluation, so it's really powerful when, it, when it's there. But once the evaluation is done and the decision is made, that, sense, that sensitive data is entirely stripped uh, as it passes through that unencrypted part of the network extension, and that's ready for reporting. So on-device content filtering can, do, can give you more and better security but in a privacy-friendly way. Who is it for? Well, when we were building the on-device content filter, and believe me, the engineering team who's been working this have been working really hard at this and making, it sure, making sure that it works really well. And I really am looking forward for everyone here in this room and also uh, around the world. Uh, test it out. You've got the trial, right? So you should definitely give it a go. So, but when we, we were building this, um, we thought about students and parents. We wanted to give them peace of mind uh, thanks to the privacy safeguards that are built in by design. Teachers. So we wanted to, for them to be rest assured that uh, policies can be as, very, as broad or as specific as they would like them to be. At schools, you, know, you might want to have very broad uh, policies around keywords or maybe the specific apps that you want to block, but maybe you want to narrow it down to a specific page so you can be as broad or as granular as you'd like to be with the on-device content filter. In the high compliance, for instance, healthcare, <clears throat> there's a lot of sensitive data that flows around the network. And we want to make sure that <clears throat> industries like, like uh, healthcare stay compliant uh, by making sure that private data doesn't flow 
outside the, the usual routes. So we, we need to make sure that that's you know, kept private. And for instance, again, also in terms of high compliance, like I said before, you can have keywords uh, around uh, specific confidential content you would not like to have leak out of the usual confidential routes. <clears throat> and then, most importantly, let's not forget about our amazing admins. They want to have an effective and comprehensive set of tools in their arsenal that go hand in hand with Apple principles. And that's what we're giving them with the on-device content filter. So we're thinking about the end user. We're thinking about the admins. We're thinking about uh, organizations. So really is an upgrade for everyone. Now, can we see it in action? And yes, we will. So let's just play this that I did the other day. Um, it's very easy to set up the on-device content filter, and also very easy to use it, uh, have it like use it uh, uh, as a way of creating policies and, and testing it out. So usually, we would go through the usual workflow for activating a device. And at the point of having to download an, an activation profile for a device, you get two options. Uh, you would download the one for iOS and iPadOS supervised devices on, iOS, on 16 and over. So th that one contains the on-device content filter. Once it's deployed and a zero touch activated, then you can start testing out some rules. So in this case, I used uh, just an IP address, 1.1.1.1. That's always a mouthful. You got BBC, and then you've got a path for the BBC, which I wanted to allow as an exception rule, which was CBBs, which is a kid's version. Basically, they have games, and like educational games, and some information for kids. And uh, yeah, so I blocked that domain, I, blo I blocked the IP address, and I allowed that path. So let's test it out now in the iPad. So I put that IP address, and as you can see, it's blocked. Then I just went ahead and went to the BBC website, which is blocked. And finally, uh, I just wanted to test out if the path as an exception rule is allowed. So I just went ahead, typed that in, and let's see if it's allowed. And yes, it is allowed. So very granular controls there. And now I'm going to check out the Netflix rule here that I put as a bundle ID in our app blocks uh, policy page. So I've typed it in, I saved it in. And as you can see now, there's a red bar at the top of Netflix. That means there's, no, there's a connection error. There's some cached content there before from when, when I used the app. And I wanted to show you this as well, because it, you can't really do anything right now. Everything is basically blocked. Like you can see, I tried to scroll down. I tried to open a series. It doesn't do anything. It's fully blocked. And um, you can still download an app, but the traffic that comes in or out of that app is totally blocked. So it's entirely useless at that stage. So um, on-device content filtering. And all the features that I just demoed are available today uh, for everyone with Jam Security Cloud and Jam Safe Internet on iOS and iPadOS. I hope you give it a go and looking forward to hearing what you think. Thank you very much. Now I'll open it for Q&A. Thanks. Y'all, thank you for submitting questions. So our first question is, what if the site classifications change? When can the on-device cache be overwritten or changed? Any update to the policy will uh, automatically signal the device to fetch that new policy. So it's, yeah, then it, it will result in a new policy and uh, it will be applied. Cool. Another question. The current URL filtering solution results in several work stopping false positives for internal and external traffic. Is this solution being investigated for macOS and any idea of a timeline? Yeah, the macOS question I knew was going to come. Uh, we're looking into it. So um, definitely uh, something we're exploring. It's worth saying that the on-device content filter uh, the way we're trying to tackle it for macOS uh, might work a bit differently because the network extensions that we have at play there are uh, the way Apple has designed them are a little bit different. So we're just exploring the area right now. Will it be able to do any additional YouTube filtering options? Nice. Yeah. So 
one thing about uh, the way traffic flows work in the on-device content filter is that uh, sometimes like when there's a new traffic flow and you open it uh, up, it needs to keep checking uh, if you're still uh, browsing on YouTube. So we're looking into this as well, how we can actually tackle uh, the way of, uh, the way, you know, uh, keep alive connections work on YouTube. They make it very hard, uh, but uh, it's something we're, we're also exploring. So definitely all ears on that. Kind of in the similar vein, will <laughs> on-device content filtering account for the variety of progressive web apps that are created to access sites like TikTok, TikTok Viewer, TikTok Feed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. As soon as that becomes a bit more widespread, we can look into doing something like that. Are there any reporting options? I don't know. That's, reporting that's, options. Yeah. There are reporting options. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if uh, it's anything more specific though. That, that. If anyone has a spe more specific to that question, <laughs> feel free to add it. Um, and then. Yeah, so I mean, on Jam Security Cloud and Jam Safe Internet, you can download reporting. So you can actually download a report from the last few days or whatever you want to see. And, and yeah, uh, depending on the tools you have, you can uh, analyze the data however you want. Oh, that was, I thought you were. <laughs> I mean, it's not a bad question, but fair enough. Cool, last question. Does the content filter also allow for whitelist configuration rather than blacklist? Yes, yeah, so um, like I said, like, you can create that, those exception rules which you don't allow, but like for everything else that I talked about, uh, you can allow. Um, for apps, right now we're supporting blocking because that was the biggest use case, but uh, we're also looking into allowing them. That is all. Well, thank you all for joining. And um, where can people find you today? Just around here or on LinkedIn. So just look up for Hernan Romero. Or, I mean, you can very easily deduce my name and then the email address at jam.com. So, yeah. Cool. Thank you thank so you. much. Cheers.